early this morning to enable to get Alex, uh, who's coming to us from where, Alex? Well, Switzerland, near Basel. Good deal. And that, so it's a little early just to catch uh, time on uh, on Alex's schedule because he said his daughter went back to school. Yeah, things going well. Back to normal would be probably be too optimistic, but here schools are reopening. So um, my little daughter went back to school first time in two months. Huh? So a big change. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, good to see. Here, they've kept schools closed until the fall, but the restaurants have now reopened or can reopen. Some of them did not, chose not to, because compliance with uh, uh, the COVID-19 rules of everybody has to wear masks. You, have to, you can only see 25% of your normal customers. This is Fairbanks. And room is a space is at a premium, so all restaurants are really crowded. Because uh, so now you're telling uh, some restaurants you can only have one table active for inside dining, and that is wow. a little prohibitive. Uh, so we're uh, <clears throat> we're I think already they're looking at a fifty percent capacity opportunity, and I, I think we'll be back to normal here within a month or so, normal in a relative sense. Right, I understand. Yeah, and I, I also just pulled retail data from uh, basically last week. You know, changes versus prior year, and the picture look looks actually actually very encouraging for the U.S. too. So, at least That's from that great. point of view. That's great. We're going to switch over because Alex found this cool way so he could share his screen, and we're going to show it like this. So you'll see little bits of us. We're not interesting. The data is interesting. <laughs> Isn't that the right way to talk about it, Alex? Yeah, absolutely. And obviously, we don't want to do here any canned webinar type of presentation. It's going to be a dialogue. We decided that we talk a little bit about data, about you know what's happening here on the Amazon platform, what's happening out there in books. And uh, later, we also talk a little bit about whatever categories and whatever is on your mind. And you can put the questions in there. And I look forward to a good discussion. You bet. You bet. So right now, COVID-19, what are the fiction opportunities? Because nonfiction, you saw some, you highlighted, hey, here's some books that took off. What are the fiction opportunities during uh, the last two months that you're seeing? Well, fiction was a very interesting story because a couple of things happened. First of all, and you can argue that's not fiction, but obviously the big number one winner of all this uh, were children's ebooks, right? Before we even go into the fiction, but that's an important thing to understand because it then leads right into what happened happened in fiction. So remember, last week we discussed this with this one thing that obviously everybody knows by now that the ebook sales basically surged across the board during COVID nineteen, right? So the interest for ebooks, everybody standing at home, and and just by the way, today also. Uh, over the last week, the big uh, publishing companies started offering their quarter one numbers. And that was really interesting to see because all of a sudden, those who always dismissed ebooks suddenly report like 25% growth year on year in their ebooks. So we will come to that later, but that may be a big danger now that uh, traditional publishers got the appetite again. <clears throat> ebooks but to your question you know we we saw that one thing last week where we had this big surge in like interest for ebooks on google and it like uh, doubled during during that time but what we then found was you know this is what happened in kids books so the interest for kids books went like tenfold within a matter of like two weeks i mean imagine tenfold yeah. And and all of a sudden, you know, we see uh, in, in the Amazon bestseller list, and today it's a little bit back to normal. You see more fiction again. I think right now, number one on Amazon is is back like a, you know a six pack abs type of romance guy. If I looked at it correctly this morning, but the picture we saw basically uh, almost only like two weeks ago, one one week ago, was that all of a sudden the top 100 store wide were plastered with ebooks right uh, sorry with kids books so yep. this is normal books including print so end of april we had kids book here kids book there even my childhood book the very hungry caterpillar was like in the what is this the top top 
15, yeah, top 15 store wide. So all of a sudden you have that picture. And um, so what happened in, in fiction? Well, the first thing is we have this huge surge in kids books, which rose to number one. And very closely related to that, you found uh, basically teen and young adult fiction go back, go back up again, right? So the big beneficiary, and that may lead over a little bit in sci-fi and fantasy. The first thing we did see as an as an opportunity was literally teens reading, uh, teens reading again. And I'm just trying to find the analysis because it's really like super fresh, um, uh, super fresh from the press where we did see that all of a sudden with the teens reading again, here we go, teens read again. I just pulled this data. If you just look overall on the teen young adult fiction category, it moved up, but you always in fiction have to see, excuse me, have to see the grander scheme of things. So if we look at the teen young adult sales here that you can see right there, um, this is over 18 months the best seller list performance. And you see, if you just look at what happened in April, May, it's a slight upward trend. So not so much happening yet relative to the market share of other genres. But what we then found is you then dig deeper, you get like really interesting pictures. This is, this is just an arbitrary example. So this is, for example, teen young adult um, romance, science fiction and dystopian. So in, in essence, what happened in two months, sales rank shot back up to, by 28% again. And it was primarily uh, the Hunger Games type of books and the um, Kiara, Kira Cass type of teen young adult series, right? Okay. And, and what here COVID did to a whole genre, if you look at it from a longer term perspective, is something like this. And I found, found this really striking because also in, in 20, 20 books, there were some discussions I, I followed sometimes, hey, my teen young adult dystopian novels are falling and then during COVID, are they on the rise again? Big question mark. Now look at this. This is the bestseller list over five years. And you see dystopian romance, you know, the, the classical Hunger Games, divergent type of genre or category where you found a lot of these books has been on a deteriorating trend for four years. And here comes the COVID crisis, teens read again. And what they revert to is, I think a bit, the classics in teen young adults so, or what haven't I read so far. And so they grab what used to be successful books hmm. in the first place. And you see this amplifying trend upwards. And as we go through the talk, we can look a bit in uh, mystery thriller suspense. We can look at uh, sci-fi, fantasy. A couple of these, couple of these genres. Okay, okay. That, that's uh, that's interesting. So the data on that twenty-eight percent upward trend of sales. How do I sales, rank. sales ranks? Okay, so how do the the stalwart old ones like uh, Suzanne Collins? And uh, the author Stephanie Myers and those uh, those folks are have they jumped up and are they accounting for the bulk of that improvement or is it across the board? Well, well as I said, I I would have to go like through the details of which individual books drove that to a large degree. But as I said, what we saw was was really a couple of the uh, classics, you know, Veronica Ross, Kira Cass, and I would have to scroll down through the books, but. Um, and, and that is the thing. It will often be up to the individual, but across the board, we saw a lot of books that used to do well in the past, you know, like get a bit of like a rejuvenation, if, if you will. Yeah. That, that's what happened there. And, and the question, Elaine, on the reading demographic, <clears throat> Alex is judging the data on the categories. So the who actually picks up books in those categories is, is kind of uh, uh, opaque. You can't yeah, see that, that data. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's always, I mean, there's obviously two two big limitations to the category data, and that's when we then move from category to to what we call the virtual bestseller lists, because one is, and that's different by category is what you call category pollution, obviously. Yeah. Right? So how how well are the books categorized? Um, and the other uh, thing that you that you do find is, yeah, there is obviously no way in telling who, who picks up those books in the end. Yeah. 
but they're set up for YA. I mean, a lot of my books I have set for YA because their books, when, <clears throat> when I looked at it, I'm like, I, I would like reading these if I was a teenager. Like I read uh, Lord of the Rings when I was uh, 11 or 12 in The Hobbit and, and those books, I'm like 13 to 18 plus. Because when I went 12, it put me in the children's categories because I read a lot of stuff when I was 12 and 10, 11, 12 that uh, I'm going to categorize as 13 because I don't want to go into the children's categories on stuff. I want I want YA and older <clears throat> for my stuff. Right. Even though I might drop the occasional F-bomb. Still 13 to 18 plus. That's what I that's what I shoot for. So you'll see you'll see almost all of my stuff in YA. Uh, and my, my nomad series, I do not cause it's post-apocalyptic and they do some, they do some pretty bad things to, uh, to people who are, who deserve it. And, uh, and so I, uh, that one, I did not, even though 13 to 18, I, I forced it into adult mainstream categories, but the, uh, but most of my other ones, yes, I, I, I go YA too, even though the vast bulk of my readership, I think 88% of my readership is 40 and older. I can imagine. Yeah. I mean, by and large, reading today has very much moved to that type of age, it almost seems, yeah. right? So. Well, because the gaming, I mean, the younger crowd, uh, they're spending their time online gaming, streaming Netflix, getting getting their entertainment that way. So if you're looking to entertain people, especially with books, you find those people who will pick up a book, who do own a Kindle, and then are willing to, to sit by and read, because that's a... Uh, even though somebody will, somebody will jump on uh, on Minecraft or Fortnite or something like that, World of Warcraft, and they'll spend hundreds of hours. But you give them a book, it's like, geez, I don't want to be trapped into one story for 12 hours or six hours, however long it takes to read a book. And it's just that perception of this one little thing when I've got a whole universe I can go into. And it's really all in your mind. It's just how you uh, perceive and and move into that world in a book, you do it all through your own imagination. I think it's more robust than uh, a, a, a game that's limiting, especially because me, I know I can jump better than I can make characters jump in a game. So uh, yeah, I don't uh, I don't play any games online or or right. even with my my PlayStation. I do have one, by the way. Though the, though the one thing in that whole say competition for entertainment or entertainment competing for the consumer, right? I think yeah. the one thing that may be beneficial here for the book sales is that obviously due to the big crisis with people suddenly having to homeschool, those yeah. who could afford it were suddenly forced to, okay, I need that other iPad or in many cases, by the way, Kindle Fire device. And what we did see, Amazon just announced its uh, th first quarter results as well, right? And they had yet another rise in quarterly subscription sales, although that entails television as well. But we did look, you know, over the time also into the electronics bestseller list. And you had obviously number one, Kindle Fire Stick, Echo, da, da, da. But then in the top 10 electronics, you had Kindle Fire devices over the last couple of weeks. And... These devices are then often bought and Amazon upsells the subscription. So very often it comes with a prime subscription. They may do a Kindle subscription. And if I just look and compare that with the ebook interest and the share gains that some genres had, uh, which we've uh, also looked at here uh, with the share games, uh, gains that happened is, well, all of a sudden you have this additional device at home. There is so much gaming you can do or the parents would allow. Yeah. I, I'm a parent too. At some point you say, hey, stop watching that video and you know do something serious. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and, and so with the subscriptions, I think there is a chance that also, you know, younger readers or the parents pick up simply download ebooks. And the big question is, will that short-term behavioral uh, behavioral change? that did happen, how much of it will stick, right? And yeah. my personal hypothesis is always that there's a lot of inertia in the book market. So while you've seen that analysis last week, you know, interest on Google for COVID-19 or coronavirus going up and down and yeah. uh, and ebooks up and, oh, you know, pretty slowly down, you know. So yeah. let's see what happens. Yep, yep. We, we have a question, a, a very specific question. And this is one that the data did not support last year, if I remember a conversation with you correctly, in that it wasn't people jonesing for books. One book took off, created a genre, and people were demanding more books in that genre. This one was a genre that was 
manufactured by some authors, popular authors were like, we're going to create the genre, we're writing books in it, and we're going to feed our readers. So how has Paranormal Prison done? <laughs> Frankly, I, I would have to look it up. I would have to do a custom research because obviously there is no category for these yeah. things, right? So what we do on these things, like whether it was the Academy romance trend, you know, that, that followed, I think, uh, the um, the reverse horror one. Now you have prison romance, there's a bit of bully romance, you know, and God knows what. So um, I would frankly have to look it up. What we did see, the, the book supply is always, you know, short term surge, surging up, people jumping onto the bandwagon. I sometimes have a little bit my doubts on the sustainability of purely supply driven trends, right? Um, although, if many authors get together and constantly bombard Amazon ads featuring that genre, we all know that in media and entertainment, trends are very often created, sometimes consciously, you know, by many people getting together. Yeah. Sometimes it's more a happen happening of some factors coming together and many people happen to do the push the same thing. Yeah. Okay. Can, uh, yeah, I can believe that. Do you have any data for audiobooks? Another question. Yeah, we, we can actually have a have a look at it. I, I think the first thing you have to understand is the overall shift in the book formats up to COVID-19. And then we can look into the ranking here. So for those of you who were at 20, 20 Books Vegas, you remember that I put up this picture and you, you may want to show this one here, Craig. Um, so that was the share of ebooks in red, Kindle editions, in each of the 30 top 100 bestseller lists, right? And you see already back in end of 2017, there was not much room to grow for ebooks and romance because the ebook penetration is already like 90% plus. So of the romance top 100, almost everything in the cross format romance bestseller list is there because of the how well the Kindle edition does. So then at 20 books, we showed the picture two years later, which looked like this. A lot more blue, a lot more blue. <laughs> a lot more blue. Now the blue is audio <laughs> and the red. So if I just switch between the two, I think it's the story is pl pretty clear how print gets squeezed. Now this is end of 2019. And we then pulled the same data um, mid-April. So just in the in the high time of the of the whole COVID, you know, oh my God, you know, and you see what's happening is first thing is there's yet another surge for the ebooks. Now we covered that before, mm -hmm. but it basically helped certain genres that did not have so much ebook penetration. It lifted them up. But you see the change in audio. If I go to info. To some extent, audio even suffered just a little. Perhaps you know, also fewer people driving to work and listening to their audiobooks while in the traffic jam. I don't know, just a uh, very cautious hypothesis. So this is the overall situation for audio. And then, if you look at which of the audiobooks are doing, how are they doing? Let me just pull up here one data. Here we go. So if you look at category sales for audio, this is when we, uh, I would have to look when we pulled this data. I think this is basically a start of this year. This is the picture of the audio sales rank, the average sales rank of the top 100 titles of each of the major audio categories. And basically you see, well, number one is the catch all literature and fiction that is not very telling. Sci-fi and fantasy is the number one audio uh, one, followed by uh, non-fiction, relationships, personal development. And then what else do we have in mystery, thriller, suspense? And here as an example, then a whole number of non-fiction ones. And what I find interesting, well, people who do read romance, they tell me it doesn't come as a surprise audio. It's just too slow to consume a romance novel, they tell me. But romance <laughs> is just in the middle of the pack. Yeah, that's interesting. I think I think one thing I saw and heard from uh, some of the audio uh, audiobook uh, distributors was that without the commutes, they've lost a lot of that uh, that market. 
that people aren't uh, picking in because they don't have time. And I've talked to some people personally who had commutes and they said, we don't, you know, I just time, re read and Netflix now. So, <clears throat> That's, uh, so, so there you go, Annalise, uh, some answers. Now, specific answers, you can jump on Klytics, the website, and, uh, and look for those reports specifically. Right, and, and and by the way, what I can do after the talk, I may stay on a little longer if, if I have access to the video then on Facebook answering questions. And I know the time is not optimal for those in America. Yeah. Due to the time difference here to Europe, but I will come back to the Facebook chat. And if you leave a question there, yeah. I'll try to catch up with those over the next 24 hours. <clears throat> there you go. What's the hottest upcoming fiction genre? According to the data, I saw the most recent report and I, I didn't think it was a surprise. <laughs> the, you mean the, the the ones that had the biggest... See, I have a bit of a problem with that question because we saw a lot of genres. You know, let's just pick one. Let's take a sci-fi example here because th this is... So, for example, let's take romance. For those who know me, the the overall romance sales, this is what happened overall. Let's go through the genres, perhaps. It's a bit more specific, right? So if we go in romance, the, we basically saw trend-wise, romance is still the number one genre. So even if you see a downward curve here, you know, don't be worried. Romance has been the number one Kindle genre for ever since we started our re recording of the data five or six years ago. It never changed. And even with this, with this downward blip that you see in that graph, that has not changed. The nuances happen a level below. And also here we found that during COVID, the, the changes were sometimes subtle. Let's take one example. So romance, COVID-19, perhaps, you know, escapism, something they want, something uplifting. So we did see here a re-rise of clean and wholesome romance as an example. Now we will be publishing our clean and wholesome report this week, uh, the new 2021. And what we saw there, you know, in the very top, fewer covers with, uh, with even with couples on it. It's more like, you know, uh, almost more like women fiction, women's sci-fi, where perhaps the degree of romance in it has also been uh, dimmed down, at least if you look look at, at the covers. So it almost seemed like, you know, people wanted to have a nice story back in the so-and-so in on the beach again, you know, while they, they, they are stuck at home. And sometimes we see these types of things then, you know, stick there for a whole six, seven, eight, nine months as something something to uh, continue, right? So that, that is one example in, in, um, in, in romance of those where you ha had an upward trend. Let's look at, um, how about sci-fi? Also sci-fi overall as a genre relative to other genres lost a little bit of market share, just a little. So you see very slightly down. And what we also found is if you look here at the sci-fi curve, the very right-hand point is the date of May, start of May, start of this month, right? And you see, okay, it dropped a little, but you see also, <clears throat> excuse me, it's often a bit of a continuation of what has been happening over the months before. So in fiction, excuse me, in fiction, we very often saw that the whole genre and what's happening in the genre is almost an amplification of trends that were already there before, either reinforcing or like something 180 degrees turnaround, like we saw in teen young adult dystopian romance. But here, clean wholesome romance, almost like an accelerator. Another one within sci-fi, let's go a level down, which of the sci-fi genres have particularly benefited and are likely, you know, if the change sticks, at least for six months, are likely to to be positive going forward. For example, here, Christian uh, Christian fantasy has not done well, has not done well over the last two, three years, to my mind, if I look at the data. And all of a sudden, you know, with, oh my God, what's happening in the world, you know, people becoming more religious again, or, you know, looking for 
uh, for some, yeah, yeah. I mean, even if you're a believer or not a believer, so if you're close to God, you know, it it may reflect in certain genres. Here, it certainly did. Um, what else do we have? Um, mystery, thriller, suspense. Let's look at this one. Also here, a very slight drop <clears throat> overall during the outset of the crisis. Market share wise, still up there. And then if you go a level deeper, um, you know, also I think then unsurprisingly, people suddenly have an interest again for, you know, techno thrillers. And you you find, you know, those conspiracy theory or, you know, buyer, not, not necessarily the the pandemic type of stuff, but you know, there you know, people read again. And what do they read in these times? They went to techno thrillers. Now, this is the 18 month picture, and you just see this 49% very short term, <clears throat> um, short term impact. But let me show you like the four, four year trend. And this is what I meant with sometimes the crisis turning things around or amplifying something that was already there. So if I, if I use my mouse here, you know, to, to point out, um, there was a huge rise, you know, in, in this category up until like mid 2017, then it was sort of flat and then techno thrillers were going down until say la a year ago. And then if you, you just have to imagine a trend line through it, you know, and then all of a sudden, you know, there a, was a weak upper trend again over Christmas sort of dove. And then with COVID, you know, it came back up again. So, but if I put a trend line through it, I would almost argue again, that the crisis almost acted again like an amplifier of some things that were already in the making or were already there as a trend in the first place. Okay. That's good info. And, and the reason sci-fi went down was uh, in May, I released a mystery title as opposed to a sci-fi title. So uh, it's me. I, I told you, yeah, yeah. I, we've been tracking, you know, Craig Martell titles, as soon as they come out, the whole genre is like, Going through the roof, um, our our the computer has a hard time to compute all the stuff because the increases are so alarmingly high that uh, we always get this red flag of data inconsistencies. You, you talk about market share, and I understand what how you uh, how you get your data and how you calculate your data. But can you can you briefly explain what data you're looking at to determine? that that market share based on book rank yeah i mean basically what is what is happening we can only analyze what is there there right so on amazon there is two pieces of information that are like public right the one is on every book you have a sales rank and we for those of you who want to know deeper how it is computed um, we can do so later but Basically, that is a relative measure of how well the book is doing relative to all the other uh, 6 million plus English speaking titles on the Kindle platform. All right. Number one is good. Number four million is not so good. So if you have that data for a single book, you can obviously look at it um, for a whole category. Now, the one thing we do, which is important because yes, you can browse on the Amazon website, right? But we also know that the sales ranks fluctuate like hell, you know, um, in any given period of time. So basically what we do, we, we monitor the data uh, over several days uh, during the whole month so that we have a, say, a representative as possible sample of the top 20 or top 100 in each of the category. I know there is a debate, should you look at the whole top 100 of the bestseller list? We do that for the big genres. For the sub sub categories, we sometimes figured, look, if you look at the top 20 error in the detail, but comparing the, the cost of data collection versus accuracy is, is still a good trade off. So long story short, once you compute averages of sales ranks over time, you iron out those very short term peak and valleys with yeah. that you would have if you look at the bestseller list written now and tomorrow again and tomorrow again, it's sometimes very hard to draw conclusions of these momentary pictures uh, that you get. So one thing is the sales rank. Now with a sales rank, we have a project with authors going on that relate sales ranks somehow to 
to finance. Now with KU, that's a bit tough. We know that in the earlier days, it was easier because sales rank was only attributable to a paid copy. Now it's also attributable to a download of a basically a borrow. And then the revenue generated by that is not instantly, but then with some delay. So that is pretty difficult. But by and large, the demand side, the market shares, very safe bet is to look at the relative ranking motion as we did here. I'm a bit more cautious than we, when we then convert this into monetary terms. There is a, you know, can be a, a bit of a margin of error. And the other big information that we look at is obviously the size of the categories. And that information is no longer public. Well, it is up to a category size of 6,400. Amazon, you can still get an accurate number, but they stopped this display. But since we've been tracking the increment every month from the last time around, it was published. I think we still have a very accurate database of like the 7,800 genres with how big the individual categories are. So long story short, we measure supply, we measure demand. The big inputs are bestseller lists, very importantly, monitored over time to iron out those peaks and valley of short-term performance and then put the picture together. Good deal, good deal. Thanks for that, Alex. We have a question. Are you seeing increased trends towards shorter books? Um, no, at least not sales-wise. Every two years, we, we, well, we see two things. There is the technical category of short reads on Amazon, right? Which is a category that you cannot put your book in. Amazon does it for you if your book qualifies as having 100 pages or less. Now, these short reads, we've been monitoring the sales rank for four years, five years now. And basically, they're by and large, they're, they're not doing well relative to normal ebooks. Why don't they do well? Uh, well, I think they're just too short reads, right? For the for the for the money money you 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 pay, and Amazon may also in their algorithms don't feature them so much. They are a distinct part of the store. So if people consciously look for like really short reads, you find them. Now, does that mean that short books are not successful? No, because once you get above a hundred pages. Um, you are a normal ebook, yeah, and you also show up in the normal store. But we've seen basically no evidence that shorter books are doing well. I would say quite the contrary if I look at just the short reads up to 100 pages. But what we did see is a huge market share gain, um, relatively speaking, over the last three years in serialized fiction. That does not mean that the books in the series are not standalone. They very often are and will even have in the book description huge disclaimers saying, hey, this is a standalone book, but it is part of a series. And you suddenly find the top 100 in mystery, thriller, suspense, 70% is series books, same in sci-fi. Um, yeah. And that is what I see. So to answer the question, a trend to shorter books? No, a trend to relatively short books and they form part of a series, clearly, clearly yes. Yeah, series is a good choice. And and also one thing that Amazon was pushing was exclusive to Amazon, and these were shorts, and Amazon pushed them through every venue they had. I know N.K. Jemison and uh, I think Dean Coots had a short that was exclusively from Amazon to welcome these authors yeah. as Amazon imprint authors. So those got pushed. So any data, I would say, is probably 90% attributable to Amazon pushing these these shorts because I, I pulled one up. I'm like, holy cow, a new title. Yeah. And it's like, oh crap, this is a short read. And this is this is marketing. Hey, welcome Dean Koontz to come on board with Amazon imprint. Big, big, huge move to steal him away from uh, uh, from Trad. But Absolutely. there it is. But it was a short. It's like, okay, it was like a reader magnet for Amazon. So we have a question on the screen regarding contemporary story storylines. Readers usually jump on the popular bag bandwagon. I would question that premise. Uh, do you know any hot tropes that are most popular in the contemporary world now or upcoming? Um, like across the board, you know, uh, very hard to very hard to tell. I mean, what we did see right now is said. Um, 
w well, women's fiction doing extremely well. We just looked at, you know, a uh, big bit of a renaissance of romantic comedy. So it, it seemed in, in romance, for example, two streams, clean and wholesome. As I showed earlier, we saw romantic comedy uh, going in, in there. Um, the very popular tropes or like subject, some, you know, a trope is already like very detailed. So I wouldn't jump to the detail level and tell you, you know, whatever prison romance or con uh, this type of romance it, it is now. Um, the next romance report will tell. But what we did also see um, things like uh, female protagonist thrillers, a trend we already looked at like two years ago. You know, it continued right up there. Psychological thrillers doing very well. Um, all, also often with female protagonists, um, just to name a few. Yeah, that was. Uh, I, I see that my female protagonist uh, series are doing well. They do just as well as anything else. I really don't. Uh, I don't see the difference except when I do a survey of my readers and I find out that I'm like 55 women, 40 percent, 45 percent men, and all right. almost all of them 90 percent over uh, over 40. So uh, hey, I don't. I don't. I don't question it. I just that's what I target with my Facebook ads. I go after certain demographics. Uh, sorry, younger readers, if you don't see my ads, but uh, your mom will tell you about them. Um, I agree. I agree. <laughs> tell you about the books. <clears throat> but uh, did, on audiobooks, uh, going back, Annalise uh, followed up her question with WhisperSync. Do you get any data regarding WhisperSync when it comes to audio? Uh, well, we, we actually would have the data. I frankly have never uh, I never analyzed it. So if, if this is the homework, yeah. I, 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 I can absolutely have a look at it. Yeah, I don't. Annalise, uh, Annalise is a, a narrator as well as running a publishing company, and and for with audiobooks as well. And that is a an issue. I mean, does how does WhisperSync do compared to other audio in regards to uh, uh, relativity relative to the to the sales? And one thing that uh, Michael Anderley, uh, LMBPN, just announced is that they're going with multi uh, uh, narrator presentations as a different form of audio. And they just signed a contract for, I think the first 20 books to wow. uh, to make multi uh, cast presentations with, with sound effects and stuff like that. So good old, uh, good old studio, uh, almost like a, a movie on audio. Right, right, right. Yeah, I mean, some of these have, have been doing well, right? But obviously the production costs probably also shoot, shoots way up, but that's the price of differentiating yourself. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. For some making something that's just better. Cause if you have uh, I've heard, Hey, Will Wheaton narrated a book and you go listen to it. It's like, Holy crap. This is just a dude reading it. Whereas you get narrators, some narrators act, they have different voices for every part and they, and they really do it up hard. Uh, and, uh, and that is actually the majority of the narrators. You will get them doing different voices and giving each, character a unique element and then you'll have some people just read it i mean and that's what uh, will wheaton has been accused of is that he just reads the book for you so it, it changed your title to say read by as opposed to narrated <laughs> by right 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 to totally got you totally got you losers i mean winners we're going to talk winners here <laughs> Win it. Uh, yeah, I mean, this was just, I, I think we covered some of that uh, already earlier in the talk, but for those ones who, who came back later, I mean, here, the data is basically stating the obvious what you feel at what you feel at home, right? Here, you want to keep your kids busy, um, crafts, hobbies, and home. So that was, by the way, that was a really a fun one, you know, where suddenly you have the gardening books and, uh, you know, uh, shooting, shooting back back up in in sales sales rank uh, sales rank again um obviously the medical ebooks but, but see, uh, the the point i wanted to make here if you just compare it relative to the previous months here in april yeah you do have losers such as romance such as mystery thriller suspense sci-fi is not on there because it's right there in the middle it didn't uh, in april it didn't have much uh, change at that point in time That's because I just because I released a, a couple sci-fi books in the, April. Which yeah. obviously, as we covered earlier, is the prime driver of the whole genre. And uh, But the one point I wanted to make for also those who joined later, it's really important to see, yes, relatively speaking, during those two months, these genres previously suffered, but also I think today, book uh, a couple of days ago, BookScan for the print books came out uh, with, with some data. 
and th they see yeah also adult books come back up again so um i think everything is pointing a little bit back towards the back to the hey let's let's back, get back to normal right and, and i think everybody can do for himself him or herself go onto google and go on google trends and type in coronavirus right and i think this has further come down so so I just see a lot of things go back a little bit to normal. And for those of you who who um, saw my video that that Craig shared the other day, and by the way, part two is coming today, also based on some of this oh, new right. data um, today or tomorrow, where we <laughs> re-record some of this data. But but see, this is the thing. I think this was a very important picture to, to discuss last last week, Craig, because. All what I'm seeing from the data, this is the sheer interest on Google for the bad stuff, right? And we saw the good stuff, ebooks has shot up. If we look at consumer spending in, in the in the US, I found that also an extremely interesting uh, picture and just the new data has come out. I think this is a picture that everybody should know who is in anything that is sold to consumers as our books, right? So this is retail consumption and mind you, this is physical retail consumption. So this is what's happening out there in the US in the stores, right? So while we were still going here in March, this every bar shows the, the change of retail dollars spent of that week compared with a year before, right? So in March, you know, March 7, that was still positive compared to the year before. And then things took a dive. And the worst week was the last week of March where retail sales out there with all the stores closed were a 30% less than the year before. But you see already in the ensuing week, it was not as bad not as bad the week after, not the bad week after. And now this market research company, they even withdrew their post where they posted, hey, things are basically back to normal. We have the same amount of sales as we had in last year, April 25. Uh, and they say Easter and weather conditions distorted the numbers and they just came out with the first week of May. So all what I'm seeing here is if we then look, how did that, what did that do to the book market? Well, in the book market, yes, February was so-so. March took the dive. What can we expect for April? Well, there already, uh, they reported that like in the first week of May or something, print books are coming back, back up again. So long story short, I think there's good news on the horizon in terms of overalls, the eBooks really went up. Has it materialize in your own book report i cannot tell you but at least the climate for ebooks was great and it seems overall the book market industry as a whole seems to be pretty resilient to the downturn in by and large and, and that's print book if you look at the stores closed because the bnns are closed across and those are account for the massive uh, majority of books then and people aren't going to the grocery stores and browsing because they don't get they they aren't allowed that opportunity. One person, one family member, so you don't have the kids screaming, "I want that book! I want that book!" And uh, I, I they're going to be down even worse in April, just my estimate because it's just uh, uh, yeah stuff not open. And then and also Amazon wasn't printing, and they just started printing again in April because they didn't have the computer processing power for the deluge that they got uh, submitted to because everybody was online. And uh, and hopefully as people go outside, weather's, weather's turning beautiful, it's beautiful here. It was 80 degrees yesterday, which is unheard of for Fairbanks in May, but it was 80, so a little toast, but everybody's outside. You could hear motorcycles, you hear quads, you could hear uh, uh, yelling and screaming and people working in their gardens and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, people are not inside right now. They're not going to the stores, they're just being outside for this little, a microscopic view of the universe. And I think a lot of the US, despite the polar vortex that hit the Eastern US, there's still, things are going to return to normal despite uh, any any warnings and stuff like that, because humans, we've been free for so long, we will not be denied. Two months <laughs> yeah. at most, you can uh, I, tell I somebody, 
I mean, if you've ever gone to an old folks home where people have been put into homes, they just is like, Fuck, I, I just want to get out of here. And you talk to them, but you can't, you need full-time care. And it's like, no, I want to get out. And, uh, you know, uh, and now you have the wherewithal to get out of there. Uh, so you do, and people leave or go on for drives and, and th they're not going to be denied. It's just uh, uh, risk versus gain as they see their lives uh, uh, plummeting. Businesses are like, I, I got to open or I I'm never going to open. And uh, yeah. they're diving back in. It's just, this is, this is me. I, I, I uh, was a career intelligence officer. And one of the main things we analyzed was we didn't analyze a capability as much as, or intent as much of, as human nature and human behavior because you can yeah. have a tank you can have the desire to take over a city with a tank but if in your nature is i'm not going to drive that tank and your your supply and logistics nobody's going to get you fuel you only have two rounds so you're not going to take over anything with a tank no matter what you want or no matter the fact that you have a tank and uh, when you're mm -hmm. looking at people you can tell them to stay inside but uh, a lot of people are hurting they need to go to work and so uh, you have these two sides, people who don't need to go to work or can stay at home, people who might be making more at home, vice uh, working for the for uh, uh, the frontline workers, some of them because of the, but they got in early and the unemployment system broke. There's other people who really need it, aren't getting it. I mean, it's a, it's a total mess, but this is what you get when you have governments involved and you have to. So it's, it's all understandable. So you have some people spending more, you have some people spending less, you have everybody wanting to get the hell out of the house, even me, who I usually work at home. So it's there the human nature view of the world is that things are going to return to normal, even if there is a, a higher risk to humanity uh, people are going to say, screw it, because uh, I watch Jaws, and even after watching Jaws, I was able to not go into the frickin' ocean for 20 years. So uh, There you go. And I think that raises a very interesting question on what you have all over the media, this question about what, what's the narrative. A new normal. So is there a new normal? And I always, we, we try to ask ourselves, well, is there a new normal for books, right? Now, for print books, we already see things go back towards some normal as the stores open back up. But what I would really like to closely monitor over the next six, six months, is there a new normal for eBooks? And I think there yeah. will be two important factors. The one is this behavioral change of people who haven't consumed eBooks before, they now were forced to do so with yeah. the graphs we sh shared earlier. So question number one, will it be sticky and to what extent? Uh, hypothesis, some of that change will stick. We actually already see it. Um, yeah, I don't want to belabor the point on, on, on the kids' books, but we saw the kids' books, the seasonal peaks always at Christmas over the last four years and the Christmas at Easter. And already after Christmas, even before COVID, the books did not go down into the valley as they used to. And then with the crisis, it was like amplified and now kids' books are all up there. And the question is, it's already amplified a trend that all was already there. But the second point we haven't touched upon yet, and I just pulled up this slide uh, with, with quotes that I read today, because all the big publishing companies pu publish their quarterly numbers, and they all report these horror stories about their outlook, profit outlook for the whole year. And they report the horror story about print books in the, in the, in the first quarter. However, then, always in the second paragraph, just read this. Ebook sales at Simon & Schuster's were up 13% in the first quarter over the quarter before and were running 25 to 50% over what it was in Q1 2019. Now, that is a traditional publisher, mind you. HarperCollins, total digital sales increased 3% in the quarter, so compared to the quarter before. Not phenomenal, right? But it counted blah, 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 blah up to 21% in the comparable quarter in fiscal year 2019. And then also the parent company of HarperCollins here, you know, they saw a big revival in, in eBooks. And the big question I have here, because here we are talking to the indie community, um, I think the only competitive threat I see right now is the good news, consumer behavior towards eBooks. The bad news is 
over the last three, four years, for the big publishers, ebooks were not even on the radar screen, right? They, they, they priced them out of the market. They were not interested. They thought they, it would cannibalize the print sales. Now, all of a sudden, they see these huge surges in sales. And I would be wondering what we see in their advertising activities and in their activities towards now maintaining some of that share that they regained. What are you seeing from TradPub pricing on their ebooks? I haven't done the analysis yet. What I see on prices overall, and now we do see that some of the TradPub people went obviously into these top 100 bestseller lists across genres. Uh, let's just look at here some pricing data because you raise a very interesting point here. Across the board, we saw a lot of drastic things, right? Yeah. And the big headline on pricing was no drastic shifts. For you, the individual who does suddenly a promotion, perhaps the answer is, oh, yeah, I dropped my prices or I did this and that. But if I look at the overall price data, and this is tracking only the top 100s, right? So for individual genres, we would have to, <coughs> excuse me, dig deeper. But look at this. This is the romance. We know romance has the worst price level of all the 30 main genres on Kindle. Okay for them but they sell volume it's a bit like a mass market car yeah so this is the price data over the past 18 months of all the books in the top 100 bestseller list of which we know there are some trades in there and um so it's actually a good mix of traditional publisher pricing and indie pricing i'd say in the romance bestseller list so while you have the peaks and valleys the overall trend has been up so in may 2020 the average price is above four dollars and it came from uh november 2018 350 right so we basically moved from a trend point of view from 350 to four dollars and it was worse before i mean there were times where the average imagine the average price across the top 100 with even trad publishers in there would be like average price three dollars oh four cents as an average right so really bad so good news there price is up if you if you then look at and let's look at another genre here um, if you look at mystery, thriller, suspense, they're, you know, a bit more up and down, but over the last six months, extremely stable across the 550 price point. So higher than romance. And obviously 550 is not what you price your book at. That is the computed average of how many books are at 299, how many at 499, and so on. You know, these are the main price points. But you see here, not much change during COVID. And in sci-fi, we see a bit like a similar picture, like in romance, short-term volatility, but overall prices also trend-wise have improved from an average of say around $5 18 months ago to 550. So and none of these have dropped prices, as you saw, really during, if I just go back, no, prices in May are up. Prices here of May, April are up over pre-COVID. So none of these main genres drop prices big time, right? And why should they? Because the demand is there. Why would you, why would you reduce prices as demand goes up? Uh, wouldn't make sense from a well, from a technical point of view, but from a macro macroeconomic point of view, um, it wouldn't make sense, right? Yeah, yeah. No, I like it. I like the analysis. I like the uh, the outlook. And what are you doing going forward? What's, what are your plans for the next uh, two months? Well, next two months we have a, you know, I, I always say let's stick with the usual. So, you know, we have huge demand for the genre report. So we are updating quite a number of ones where yeah. because the strength of the report now comes more and more in the competition. So, so how does Vigilante Justice do versus the year before? I have on my to-do list, I should do more deep dive reports on some sci-fi things, which we've never done before. So I uh, take that as a potential input. Let's do the military sci-fi deep dive report. Yeah, yep. um, military, space opera. Maybe, those, uh, those two are the, um, the leading genres for sci-fi. So a lot is doing it the usual, but we will continue to basically increase our output for these genre reports because they've proven very valuable 
for um, the, the feedback is basically because they they also look at the top selling covers and you know that sort of stuff calculate market shares for certain cover types and you know that that feel it's so close data is a bit remote from the trenches but when it gets to individual books and covers then people start like liking the data even more right so we we will dive into those john reports even more um we haven't made the big audio sales data public yet so we are still collecting some trend data so what i showed you was just on the category level but you know to our elite members we will roll out some better um down to the, basically the deepest category that the audible not the audible the the audio store the audible store on the amazon platform has because audible doesn't publish sales ranks on the amazon platform there are the sales ranks um the other homework we're still hard on is other countries right so we do get mm -hmm. these questions from the romance authors hey can you do a it's very specific can you do a romance study on the german market right and um, and that's obviously the type of thing to the real professional publishers. They want to have not just what's the Roma German Kindle market, but can you tell me what is selling in romance? And we did an interesting pilot in mystery thriller suspense where I was surprised how cliche the German thriller market was. You know, when it comes to covers, cover color, and we looked at France, it was completely different, but within France would like the same. And I think that could be interesting to the uh, bigger indies as they uh, start to get their works translated and trying to move and basically capitalize on their assets in, yeah. in foreign markets. So so talk, let's talk Swiss. So what language of books do you prefer? Huh, if I already knew that, I, I still read German books. Obviously, there are three official, three official languages. Mm -hmm. um, actually, four, you know, there's like a little uh, Reto Romanic, which is like a special switch. Uh, uh, yeah, it's basically a, spe a special language. But the big okay. ones are obviously German, Italian, and uh, and French. I think the prime uh, reading language, also, if you look at, I mean, Swiss is Switzerland small, you know, what yeah. are the 10, 10 million people. So it's not a market we analyze. But if you look at the foreign markets, I would definitely look at the big German market. It's a German, huge book yeah. market, uh, you know, 81 million people, um, many readers. It's a culture of avid readers. Yeah. We were way, be I once did a favor to a friend who was in Italy and we did an Italian Calytics report four years ago. If you're interested, I can send it to you for free if you send me an email. I think I sold five copies on a webinar four years ago. It's like, you know, no reading, well, no ebook reading culture at the time whatsoever. And I think also Spain and France will be very slow. So my first bet would clearly be the German market if I were to translate my words. Well, Spanish, obviously, once you talk about the South American markets, different story, right? From a sheer population size, but yeah. that would be my bet in Europe. But German, absolutely, and you'll see the biggest uh, the biggest names in indie publishing are are moving with uh, titles, and even some of the biggest indies themselves who don't have a lot of titles, maybe less than ten, but have realized some level of success, are moving over and and uh, getting them translated professionally and putting yeah. them into the German market. So uh, it's, a, it's a good challenge to have. It's good to see. Uh, we're going to wrap things up because, uh, and, and we're not going to be able to stay live because I, I'm paying a lot for my, my high-speed internet. And uh, All right. but, but the comments are there. You go to 20 books to 50K, you'll see the CNM uh, app 78. And then also we'll cut this over to YouTube and then we may get some YouTube comments as well. So uh, just be aware. Thank you for showing the data. Thank you for showing me how that worked. I hadn't done that prior to now. And we flipped through to make sure it got the biggest part of the screen. And uh, you guys got to see uh, the presentation in addition to us just talking. And that was far more impactful than uh, just us talking about data. That's hard to verbalize. It's very hard to verbalize. So also when I'm on podcast, I always fear people fall asleep. So I, I thought let's bring some pictures. And and as I said, I, I uh, might be hanging in here uh, uh, in the chat right now to answer questions. I all, But I have to switch from this platform to Facebook. So once your video goes live on Facebook, 
I, I'll try to hang out there a bit. And uh, as said to all these, uh, all the people in the US who will probably watch the replay, I yeah. will just drop your question in the comments. I'll try to get back there. And if you have, uh, yeah, if you want to contact me personally, you always can at, uh, K -lit at support at klytics.com, k lytics.com. Just say to Alex or 20 books, it will be channeled to me and I'll try to answer personally. That's great. Thank you. How is your business doing? Klytics as a business. Very good. Q1 was up over last year and over the previous one. So um, pretty confident. You know, for me, it's more how to increase the capacity because we get more and more requests on other markets and other, um, you know, specific genres. I, as the question we had here in the thread, right? You know, can you tell me what's rocking in prison romance? You know, no, I can't. You know, it's yeah. uh, it's uh, it's tough. So twenty thousand 20, subgenres, yeah, yeah, something like that. But uh, no, Alex is not going to be able to make it to uh, Vegas twenty twenty, but he has already marked it on his calendar for twenty twenty one, and we're going to Bali's on the Strip. So uh, we're we're going high high end, at not a whole lot more uh, not a whole lot more for a conference fee because we now have enough horsepower to uh, get a good price on a big big facility. So look for Bali's in 2021, 2020. Samstown will be there. It might be a U.S. only show, but that's uh, a, only because of people traveling in and, and their own countries pro prohibiting travel to the U.S. Uh, that's uh, all out of our control, but what is in our control is we'll be working with uh, with Samstown to make sure that we can pull this show off. And uh, we're also looking at Alex to possibly do a remote session, remoting in to present. We'll put them on the big screens and uh, you'll get that presentation kind of like we had here. So you'll see Alex, he'll be pointing to stuff, he'll be making, uh, making digital data magic and... Uh, <laughs> And, and, there we and I are. hope by then, and I hope by then we can report on you know, okay, this was COVID nineteen, uh, yeah. this was and still is the search in reading in ebooks, right? And this yeah. is how indies capitalized on the trend. That that would be my, you know, envisaged storyline yeah. for the speech to tell, and I hope that it will materialize. What is sticky that? rose up during and just see and and yes that's what that's what we want to hear because it's truth not just make something up because we want to hear it but there we are all right we will see everybody later thank you for uh, for checking in and watching with us today tomorrow we have chuck gannon talking about trad pub penetration into the indie market as more and more of them become hybrids all right we will uh talk to you all tomorrow thank you very much alex really appreciate you coming on board thank you very much to you guys